Hi everyone, this is Dr. Samara Rashid and in this, in this session we will be discussing section two of Program Information and Policies Handbook of Northern Virginia Community College, the Dental Assisting Program. In this section, we will be talking a little bit about bloodborne infectious disease policy, the infection control policy, hazard communication program, management of emergencies, ionizing radiation policy, patient selection for exposing radiographs, and guidelines for the administration of nitrous oxide oxygen sedation. With the bloodborne infectious disease policy, the clinical facility at Northern Virginia Community College is a safe place for the provision of dental care. Epidemiological information supports the conclusion that there is no significant risk of contracting bloodborne diseases through provision of dental treatment when appropriate infection control procedures are adhered to. Therefore, the dental assisting program is committed to addressing issues related to bloodborne pathogens like HIV or hu human immunodeficiency, HB, uh, hepatitis B virus, and the hepatitis C virus in order to protect patients, students, faculty, and staff, as well as protecting the rights of individuals who may have, who may have a bloodborne infectious disease. So our policy here in this program is to ensure everyone's safety. That includes staff, students, and when you start seeing patients here at NBCC. It's important to know that you have your immunizations and that you practice uh, wearing your PPE. And in, in addition to that, that you practice doing um, uh, all the, uh, the uh, proper protocols and keeping everything clean and universal precautions or what we call now standard precautions. That way this will help prevent any type of disease to be spread between patient, student, staff, and vice versa. So the, blood, the purpose of the bloodborne pathogen policy and the exposure control plan is to minimize the risk of this transmission. We wanna minimize uh, also the risk to other environmental hazards. So policies will be reviewed annually and revisions will be made as appropriate. Patients infected with bloodborne pathogens can be safely treated in the dental clinics. So there's no significant risk of contracting these diseases through the provision of dental treatment when the standard precautions are routinely followed. You will learn in this program what standard precautions are about and how to practice that. Practicing standard precautions ensures that no one gets sick, no matter what disease they have. Therefore, all patients, regardless of HIV, HBV, or HCV status, will be provided dental services according to the scope of care as outlined in the respective dental program curriculum. Standard precautions for all patients will be followed. A little bit about admission or employment. So again, the dental assistant program does not discriminate against any employees or students, applicants for admissions or patients based solely on health status. Applicants who test positive for infectious diseases uh, or one disease or who are carriers of an infectious disease should seek counsel from their physician and the program director prior to application. We spoke a little bit about immunizations in section one, but in section two here, uh, the risk for exposure to hep B is higher for dental health care providers than the general population. Therefore, the students, the faculty, and staff who provide patient care or who even have contact with patients should follow the standards of risk management, thus ensuring a safe and healthy environment. Students who have been admitted to the program are required to have a physical evaluation. So they're required to be immunized against hepatitis B unless the immunity is documented. Uh, if a student is medically at risk for the vaccination, again, they have to apply or sign the, de the declination form during, orient during our orientation. And furthermore, students are required to be immunized against tetanus diphtheria and undergo the annual testing for TB. Okay, you're also required to be immunized against and or tested for infectious diseases like the mumps, measles, rubella, and varicella, as well as receive an annual flu shot. Okay, faculty and appropriate support staff personnel who have patient contact are required to be immunized against hepatitis B and undergo the annual testing for TB. And they're also advised to be immunized against infectious diseases like the MMR, the mumps, measles, rubella, varicella, and tetanus diphtheria. HIV testing, I mean, routine testing of faculty 
appropriate support staff, personnel, and students for HIV is not required by the dental assisting program. Okay. A student will be permitted to continue their education as long as their medical condition permits patient care and other individuals' health are not jeopardized or at risk. Um, in the event that an individual poses a risk to others, the program director will assist the individual in obtaining counseling and advisement regarding their health and education. Again, confidentiality. Um, all information regarding your health status of an individual is protected by the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act of 90, 1994 and 1996, uh, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, otherwise known as HIPAA. You know, HIPAA is something that will follow you through throughout your whole career. And the, you're going to learn more about it. And the basis of it is basically confidentiality, that anything that you find out about a patient, that it will be secure information and you will not spread that inf information to anyone outside the clinic or outside that treatment of care. Uh, standard precautions. Standard precautions involve the use of protective barriers like gloves, gowns, masks, and protective eyewear which can reduce the risk of exposure of the dental health care provider's skin or mucus, mucus membranes to potentially infectious materials. Um, you know, we talk a lot about PPE in section one, and it's coming up again here in section two, especially during the COVID uh, exposure. Um, you know, we, you'll always hear about PPE and always wearing it. You know, again, I will be providing you all with the goggles and the face shields so that's imperative that you wear that. You, it's also a must and mandatory that you wear masks um, you know, during your laboratory session and you maintain that six feet distancing apart uh, when attending these lab or clinic sessions. Uh, aside from wearing the PPE because of, you, know, you, wanna spread, you wanna prevent the spread of any type of you know, COVID-19 aside from that. You know, normally even with before this, I mean, we've been part of this whole PPE uh, phenomenal for forever. I mean, that was our middle name of dental assisting, let alone the dental field altogether. So it's important to know that we've been wearing masks, we've been wearing our goggles, and there's a way to don and doff, meaning to take off and put on these masks and gowns. And you will learn that, especially in chair side assisting. You will learn how to put these um, this PPE on and off. Bloodborne pathogen and infection control training. Uh, the program complies with all local, state, and federal infection control policies, including the application of standard precautions, as stipulated by the current CDC guidelines. Uh, written policies and instruction on infection control protocol uh, to minimize the risk of the disease transmission is provided in courses throughout the curriculum. So some of it may even be repetitive, but you will be learning more and more and more about these OSHA bloodborne pathogen training sessions, and you know it's it's going to be a part of your career. So the dental assisting program will follow the CDC suggested work restrictions for healthcare personnel infected with or exposed to major infectious diseases in the dental assisting clinic. Any faculty, appropriate staff member or student who engages in unsafe and or careless clinical practices, which create a risk to, health, to the health of patients, employees or students, you know, obviously will be subject to dis disciplinary action. Again, I emphasize, we're in a professional field. We have to act as professionals. When you guys graduate um, after this program, it is important to know to be professional with your patients as well as with your coworkers. Okay, so any faculty or appropriate staff members or students who are exposed to uh, bloodborne pathogens in the course, um, you're expected to follow the procedures set forth in the exposure control plan. Uh, if a faculty member, appropriate staff member, or student uh, should should become um, should become exposed to a patient's body fluids in a manner that may transmit a bloodborne infectious disease, the patient will be asked to be tested for the disease. When it comes to communication of bloodborne pathogen policies related to patients, patients are informed of the bloodborne pathogen policy at their initial appointment. The bloodborne pathogen policy is available upon request, of course. Infection control policy, you know, infection control, like I said before, is going to be the basis of your career. Um, the purpose of this infection control policy in, in, on a whole is to minimize the risk of transmission. Uh, and you want to minimize the risk of bloodborne pathogens to patients and dental health care workers in the dental health care setting. 
And the goal of minimizing, this goal of minimizing the potential exposures can be achieved by, you know, four things. And one of them is requiring immunization. The second one is proper education and training about the methods that we have to follow for proper infection control. Uh, and the third one is definitely, you know, prevention, prevention, prevention. You want to prevent parental, mucous membrane, non-intact skin exposure to any of these, you know, um, uh, contaminated fluids um, or to any like blood whatsoever. And the fourth one, of course, is controlling the contamination of items and personnel in the clinical setting by consistent use of aseptic techniques and proper PPE and protective barriers. Standard precautions, again, I mentioned this, um, the, the term refers to a set of precautions designed to prevent the transmission of any, you know, of any bloodborne pathogens. And in the manual, we've listed some of them as being HIV, hepatitis B, and other, you know, bloodborne pathogens in the healthcare setting. And the rationale is that it deals with the routine medical health history information is limited. And it's unlikely that a dental health care professional will know the patient's status for having a bloodborne infectious disease. We don't know if a patient that walks in is telling you everything, or maybe they forgot to tell you something. And also, many patients are unaware. They just don't know that they're infected with a bloodborne infectious disease. Okay, so if saliva, if you get in contact with saliva or or, or their blood, you know you have that capability of transmitting the disease. And of course, there's that you know, that the fact that some patients choose just not to reveal their medical status. It is their own will if they want to say what they have or they don't. So no matter what, that's why standard precautions is so important because you want to treat every patient, everything, like it's it, that everything has a, a communicable disease or, or, or rather a, a, everybody has uh, the worst disease ever. And that way you can treat everything like that. And, you know, in the past, it used to be called universal precautions but they changed it to, you know, simply being, it is the standard precautions. Okay, and you know, dental healthcare providers should not interpret negative findings from a comprehensive exam to mean that the patient is presently free from an infectious disease or will remain so upon subsequent visits. Between now when the patient leaves your chair and the patient is gone and the patient then comes back, you have to pretend all over again. You don't know where the patient has been. So again, in between that moment and moving forward, you have to be sure that you know, I, I'm still practicing standard precautions because what if, what if something happened? It's important to know about personal protective equipment. Again, we talked about PPE, and this includes masks and, and, and gloves. So, you know, protective clothing is really important. It's important to have, you know, your arms covered during lab. You know, we don't want exposed skin. And that's why when we mention when you wear socks, we want, we want the white socks. You can wear hose. That's fine. We don't want exposed skin. I mean, of course, you know, when you walk into the clinic, of course, you have hands, you know, neck is exposed. But I mean, you know, within reasonable means, we have to make sure once we start treating the patient that we have our gloves on and there's no half sleeves. Everything's got to be covered. Okay? Uh, again, masks are disposable um, and they're to be worn whenever aerosol spray, spray or splatter is, is generated or you anticipate that. So you should you know, uh, you should keep that in mind. And also keep in mind, a fresh, a fresh mask is to be worn each time a patient is to be treated or when the mask becomes damp, visibly soiled or spattered. You know, there's, there, you're not supposed to be reusing a mask from patient to patient, okay? Uh, it's got to fit snugly to the face, uh, uh, particularly around the nose and the mouth, and sh they should not be worn more than one hour. Masks are to be discarded after a single use and they're to be worn while cleaning and even processing instruments because you never know if you get that one splash and it went in your face and those are contaminated instruments. Non-latex gloves have to be worn by all faculty and students during all patient treatment where there is the possibility of contact with the patient's blood, saliva, or mucous membranes. All the gloves that are used during patient care activities have to be discarded after a single use. I don't, again, I go back to what I said in section one it's very important that you do not take your gloves and leave the, the, the area where the patient was sitting and go up just to get a certain instrument. Or, oh, I just, I'm, this hand is clean. And I don't want to hear like somebody coming up to me and saying, oh, you know, these gloves are clean. You know, I, I just came to pick up something. No, when, if you came up to a certain table and, and, or you came up to a certain area and you have gloves on, I'm assuming they're dirty. That's it. And you can't, your, your verbal claim, that's not good enough. And it's not about taking it personally. It's about, that's just the way it is. We're trying to train you to be like the, a super dental assistant. 
So, you know, we do have a lot of things to say in the manual and it's important for you guys to sit down and read. A lot of this is, is very repetitive, but it's important that it gets drilled, you know, drilled into you and it because, uh, becomes a part of your mantra, all of it, okay? And of course, you know, before and after you put these gloves on, it's important that you hand wash and you'll be, we'll be teaching you how to wash your hands properly. There's a certain way, believe it or not, there's a certain way to wash your hands because there are many areas on your hands that are frequently missed. And it's been shown that they've been frequently missed. Of course, when you have gloves and they are contaminated, and let's say you dismissed your patient, patient's gone, you, 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 know, you could still technically wear some other type of gloves over that, and those are called over gloves. And we will be seeing that in the clinic. And over gloves are used for like brief single use occasions and they're put over your exam gloves. They're not an acceptable alternative to exam gloves and are to be discarded after a single use. So if a faculty or student needs to leave the dental operatory during the treatment of a patient, over gloves should be used. They're kind of really oversized, very big gloves. Uh, sometimes they even look like, um, like a saran wrap or they look like uh, Ziploc bags and they go over your gloves and you can use that for like a quick, you know, you, you got to grab something, a pencil or something, and that's okay. You can go ahead and do that. But, you know, again, you can't wear over gloves and go into the patient's mouth. You know, when you come back, you rip those over gloves off and continue as you were. So it's more of like a to be continued uh, type of uh, theory. So acceptable use for over gloves includes opening drawers, uh, a cabinet, containers, making an entry in a patient's chart, and even just pouring impressions. Utility gloves are different. Now, utility gloves, you may have seen many people, you know, wash dishes, and they're very, like, hefty, like, um, they're very thick, and they're pretty long. I, I, some of them go up to almost the elbows. So they're not supposed to be used during direct patient care activities. They're to be worn for cleaning and disinfecting the dental operatory, as well as when handling contaminated instruments. Utility gloves are to be washed and disinfected after use. Protective eyewear, again, you know, I cannot stress this enough. You have to make sure you wear your protective eyewear at all times because when you're cleaning instruments or even working on a patient, you never know when there's a splatter and it goes in your eye and that's a potential exposure. Uh, again, prescription glasses, they're just not enough. You got to wear side shields or you wear the goggles that we have for you, which is on top of your prescription glasses and they have an elastic band in the back. Because if you wear your prescription glasses and you rely on them, there's actually, you can feel the air going under the glasses and into your eyes. So you have to be very careful and mindful of that. Okay. Hand hygiene, we will be going over that even further in the curriculum and you will be learning a lot about them. It's very important, you know, a lot of people not wear nail polish and it's very important that all you guys not wear acrylic nails. The wedding band, I mean, a wedding band is okay. I don't want to see the rock. You are not allowed to wear, you know, a, a wedding ring or any type of thing with stones in it, wedding or no wedding. I mean, marriage or no marriage, any type of fashion ring or anything, it's got to be removed, okay? Um, a plain band is simple band. I can understand is fine, but no stones must be in it because, you know, germicides, anything can get stuck within those engravements. So it's very important to understand that. Okay. So cleaning and disinfecting your dental operatory. Again, this is part of your chair side course. We will be going into this a lot, lot more uh, and much, much in depth in your chair side course, as well as in the laboratory uh, clinic sessions that you will have on Fridays. Uh, cleaning and disinfection of the dental operatory are important steps for controlling the transmission of pathogenic organisms from contaminated surfaces, as well as to minimize the exposure to these microbes. Um, the, you know, we do have a couple of procedures listed here that are utilized when cleaning and disinfecting a dental operatory. You have to wear your protective eyewear, mask, and, and utility gloves when you're cleaning and disinfecting. And at the beginning of the day, you have to flush those water line units, the air water syringes, the oral evacuation system for two minutes in order to reduce the number of microorganisms that could be present overnight. So there's a way of opening and closing for, for the course of the day. Um, so you do have to use something called a spray wipe spray technique. And that's really important to understand. And you know, the spray, you spray the cleaning solution on all the contaminated surfaces. You vigorously wipe the surfaces with the paper towel. You spray the disinfecting solution again, and the disinfectant is to be left in place for 10 minutes, and then you wipe dry. 
Um, again, you can't just go spray crazy and spray everything. Uh, for example, the chair cannot just be sprayed. You will, you will cause cracks in the chair over time. You have to use what's called a chair soap mixture in order not to harm the material of the chair or the vinyl of the chair. You have to remove and disinfect your utility gloves. You have to place them on a towel rack to dry and you have to wash your hands. And then you, after you wash your hands, you have to remove and dispose the mask. And then at the very end, you have to remove and disinfect your protective eyewear. So there is an order that you have to follow. And you can't just use any type of disinfectant. I mean, it has to be EPA registered disinfectant in order for it to comply with the CDC guidelines. Protective barriers, if you have gone to your dentist, you'll see that sometimes there's this tape-like uh, translucent material that's present on many surfaces. And they place these protective barriers on areas that they presume will be most frequently touched. For example, the patient light handle, for example, the patient tray, the mo mobile tray siding, anywhere they think they will touch or access, you know, that's where they put these protective barriers. Of course, these barriers are disposable and they have to be removed and, tr and disposed of between each patient. <clears throat> there are guidelines for treating patients and we'll talk a little bit about the chart and the chart entry. Students are not to touch a patient's chart with contaminated gloves. <clears throat> if an entry has to be made in the patient's record during the course of treatment, an appropriate protective barrier has to be used. And we talked a little bit about over gloves. You will be using those over gloves when you have to write something or when you have to simply touch a cabinet door, et cetera. So during the patient treatment, however, students have to use techniques during the treatment of a patient that will prevent the possibility of transmitting pathogenic microorganisms through direct contact with blood, saliva, droplets, or aerosols. <clears throat> and we have a list of guidelines here in your policies manual when you're treating patients. Of course, no matter what, I cannot stress this enough, we have to use something called standard precautions. Your gloves, masks, protective eyewear, and protective clothing are to be worn when participating in patient care activities. You're gonna be learning about saliva ejectors and high volume evacuators. Any equipment that's supposed to be soiled or contaminated has to be cleaned um, uh, and disinfected immediately after using it. Uh, you can't let things just sit there and dry up because now it's gonna be much harder to clean. It should be cleaned immediately after you're done using it and when you're done with the patient. Um, you're going to learn about critical items and non-critical items, critical instruments, non-critical instruments. Um, again, if an instrument is dropped or placed in a non-critical area, it is to be set aside and re-sterilized before it's used on a patient. Wiping it down is just not good enough. If, like, for example, a saliva ejector or disposables fall on the floor, it has to be thrown away and a new one must be replaced. I mean, you know, there's a whole slew of things you will be learning in our course curriculum that you will learn like how, how to keep a patient operatory hygienic and how to maintain these standard precautions at all times. Okay, so I would like for you to make sure you go ahead and keep on reading into this. There's a lot of points, you know, uh, that I really want you to learn about sterilization of instruments, biological testing of sterilization equipment, ultrasonic cleaning of cassettes, sterilization of cassettes, and sterilization of hand pieces. This is a whole course that you will be learning about all these procedures. And it's very important for you to kind of make friends with it. So, you know, do some reading on your own and get to know this material because it will be, again, part of your career, okay? Uh, let's talk a little bit about infectious waste management. Um, you know, not everything just goes in the trash. It's important to know, and you will learn about this. Uh, that there are certain materials or certain objects that must be tr placed or tr in proper trash receptacles. For example, you can't throw away disposable needles um, in just a regular trash, okay? It has to be safely disposed of in a uh, needle dispenser, or rather, I'm sorry, in a contaminated disposable sharps or object dispenser or uh, container. And those are usually, you know, impervious or they, they are containers because those are needles that cannot perforate those containers. So those are the proper places to throw them out. They're usually labeled in, in like red boxes or 
or red containers, and you're going to learn a lot more about this. Uh, teeth also, when you take out a tooth, your, your provider takes out a tooth, you're going to learn. You don't just throw those away in regular trash, okay? Other items that are thrown in your regular trash, you know, exam gloves, cotton rolls, gauze, floss, uh, saliva ejectors, patient napkins. I mean, those are just non-critical items that you could just throw in the regular trash. So only blood-soaked or saliva-soaked items are required to be disposed of into biohazard bags, okay? Again, I, I want you to really read up on this. This is part of your homework to get to know this material and understand it. Okay. Uh, management of exposure incidents, okay, this is a big deal because we talked about this in section one. We really don't want you to panic when there is an exposure, okay? Uh, that could be an exposure related to your eye, your mouth, uh, non-intact skin, um, you know, a sharp object. This can result from like performance of a student's assignment or from a performance of employees' duties, okay? So there are certain steps that we follow for management of the exposure incident. You have to stop treatment immediately, okay? And you gotta remove your contaminated gloves, you gotta wash your hands thoroughly uh, with an antimicrobial liquid soap. Um, you know, you have to keep squeezing the site. If you see that there's blood coming out, you wanna keep squeezing the site because whatever is there, you want it to keep coming out. You don't want it to keep coming in, okay? Dry the hands and apply a small amount of antiseptic to the area, as well as like a Band-Aid. So you want to report the exposure incident to the clinical instructor immediately, and then an incident report form is to be completed by the student and the, and the clinical instructor or the program coordinator. And then it's the responsibility of the instructor or the program co coordinator to ensure that the student is aware of required testing. And of course, if the student refuses, then the instructor has to document that and the source, the patient, you know, the source patient should be identified. Like, where, you know, where was this exposure from, okay? Where was this instrument or what was this object used on? So you do have to find out or do some investigating as to where the source uh, came from. So it's the responsibility of the instructor or the program coordinator to ensure the source patient is aware of required testing for, you know, HIV, HBV, HVB, or HVC infection. If the patient refuses the testing, well, then the instructor will document refusal of the required testing um, on the appropriate form. Of course, you, it's important to know that patients aren't, you know, it's not mandated that patients have to get themselves tested. So just, you know, be advised of that, that, you know, it, it's uh, upon their own, it's upon their own will if they want to get themselves tested, okay? So again, you know, we want to prevent as much as possible, but at the same time, Accidents can happen, and when they happen, we want to be prepared and follow an exposure control plan when that uh, or if that ever does occur. Okay, please review the safe work practices to avoid potential exposure incidents. You know, again, hand washing uh, before and after. You know, avoiding uh, touching the tips of like needles, scalpels, other sharp in instruments, or sh other sharp items. Um, again, open communication is key. So, you know, please review all these, um, all these points. Uh, your handbook talks a little bit about exposure of radiographs. And, you know, again, that's very important to, uh, to talk about or to consider as well. The faculty and students are to utilize principles of standard precautions and policies of infection control, even when you're exposing radiographs. So technically there's no really sharp objects involved, but it's still important to follow those guidelines. And you know, again, you have to, we go back to the staples, cleaning and disinfecting the operatory, spray wipe spray. Uh, you gotta wear your goggles, proper PPE at all times. You have to wash your hands, proper donning and doffing of your PPE. Um, you have to place protective uh, barriers on the uh, PID. And you're gonna learn about this. You're gonna learn about the x-ray machine and how you place barriers on them and what kind of barriers you place. Um, you have to place proper barrier film on anything you anticipate to touch often. If you go out into like certain practices and you start being employed where they use traditional films and they don't use the sensor or they don't use uh, digital, um, digital radiographs, then you have to make sure there's proper barriers on the traditional x-ray film itself. So lots of things come into play. Uh, again, processing of those radiographs really pertains to um, the traditional uh, form or the traditional radiographs that, that you know, to traditional radiographs that we used to use with the film. Um, we want to wash our hands with antimicrobial soap prior to entering the dark room. We want to turn on the safe light and turn off the white light. We want to put on new pairs of gloves. So again, this pertains to more traditional 
radiographs that we use, okay? So dental materials and laboratory activities, again, you know, we talk about the principles and policies of infection control and the standard precautions must be followed when you're even in the lab. So, you know, a lot of people think, okay, the patient's gone, instruments are done, but what about the lab? You know, we got to go into the lab, we got to pour up, um, I don't know, any type of models, we got to pour up impressions. But remember that impression, although, you know, it's there, it was in the patient's mouth. So you have to be uh, mindful of the fact that this could be a source of infection, or this could be something that you're exposed to. So I cannot, you know, stress this enough that, you know, it's important that you use your proper PPE at all times, okay, because you just never know what's going to happen. Again, exam gloves, masks, protective eyewear, protective clothing, make sure your arm, ensuring that your arms are covered, okay. Uh, laboratory disinfection techniques deal with, um, you know, they deal with all working surfaces that are used in those sessions or for like laboratory activities. And you, know, you have to have proper appropriate barriers. And again, we deal with the spray wipe spray technique. And again, with the PPE has to be worn at all times. Uh, you still have to um, you know, kind of disinfect the impressions that you take on your patient's mouth. You know, those models that you take, uh, impression molds that you take and you take into the lab, you still have to spray those. Cause again, they harbor, um, they can harbor potentially infectious uh, pathogens. You know, and you're gonna, you're, gonna look, you're gonna learn more about this in dental materials, about pouring study models, cleaning and removing appliances and prosthetics, uh, bite occlusal registrations. These are all in your uh, program information and policies, and you're gonna learn a lot about them. And, you know, we, we talk about biohazard waste and, and uh, hazard communications, but it's important to know the terms and what they mean. Okay, um, and there's a list and a slew of them. So biomedical waste is not just any waste. Um, it's defined as any solid waste or liquid waste that may be present, that may present a threat um, of infection to humans. And the point of origin, of course, you wanna know where it came from. And the sharps, any device that can puncture, lacerate, or otherwise penetrate the skin is considered a sharp. And you know, it's really important to go over all those terms. and it really is in detail in your information policy manual. It all goes into a lot of detail. Okay. Your program information and policies manual mentions a little bit about labeling. Um, your sharps container and your red bag, um, your red bag shall have the international biomedical waste symbol and the words biomedical waste shall be clearly legible. So it's really important that you recognize that. And all the bags containing biohazardous waste, sharps, containers, and outer containers, they shall be labeled. If the treatment and disposal process is other than on-site incineration, so that's why it's important to know or to categorize the type of waste that you will be dealing with. Again, when it comes to labeling, you're going to learn a lot about that in a course called Chairside Assisting One. Um, containers holding biomedical waste and the sharps they're labeled at the generating facility prior to off-site transportation to a disposal site permitted by the Department of Environmental Protection or to an off-site storage facility permitted by the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, the label shall be securely attached or permanently printed on the container. So it's not like you take these containers and you throw them away. There's actually a service. There's somebody that comes out and picks them up. And when you go out into practice and graduate from this program, you're going to learn that sometimes when you reach a certain level in that container, you have to call a certain service and that service comes and they go ahead and they dispose of that container properly and they replace it with a new container for you to utilize. Okay, so you'll see different um, duties that sometimes there's a dental laboratory manager for inventory and supplies at the, at medical at the medical education campus. You'll see there's certain people that are um, assigned to that. And maybe even you'll be assigned to that when you leave from this program and you'll be in charge of that. So it's important to know those things. Um, the storage and containment of the full red bags and sharp containers, they should be stored away from general traffic areas. So they shouldn't just be anywhere. You'll see them sometimes, either they're mounted on the walls or they'll be in the actual sterilization room. And in this clinic where you are, where you'll be um, practicing chair-side assisting, you'll see there is a sterilization room and that's where the sharps container is. So it's important to keep it, you know, sheathed. You have to keep the needles capped uh, and, and we'll show you how to cap that in the upcoming courses. 
and you transfer that transfer that needle onto the tray and you take the tray and you know very diligently take it to the sterilization room and there's a way to dispose of that into those containers so like i said you know it, it's all about transporting and knowing the knowledge of where everything goes and how to handle uh, those instruments or those sharps okay again you know there is a contingency plan in place for disinfecting and also for spill cleanup again you know we try to prevent but things do happen anything can spill um, you know any surface that has come into contact with spilled or leaked biomedical waste has to be cleaned up with a solution of, of a certain or industrial strength detergent to remove visible soil before being disinfected with one of the following agents, either hot water at a temperature of at least 164 degrees for like 30 seconds, uh, rinsing for at least three minutes with one of the following chemical, chemical disinfectants at the minimal concentration listed. And you can rinse that with a uh, hypochlorite solution, iodine solution with proper concentrations, okay? Liquid waste created by these chemical disinfection operations shall be disposed of into a sewage system, okay? Uh, if existing on-site treatment or off-site transfer procedures are interrupted, the following alternate procedure will be executed. Uh, our college or NVCC will contract the temporary services of an approved transport company um, permitted by the Department of Environmental Protection Agency. And you're going to learn about this agency. Again, you may learn about it in, I believe, oral professions uh, this fall semester. All of these things are new to you but you will be learning them um, in the upcoming courses that you will be taking this fall, and if not, in your second spring semester, okay? Uh, mixing of biomedical waste, it's very important. You don't just take two chemicals and throw them together, and you'll learn about that too. Uh, you have to be very mindful of that because you can actually cause a, you know, a sort of a hazardous, a hazardous reaction between two chemicals. So, you know, we will talk about that even, for, uh, even further. Uh, training, a training component shall contain a training regimen detailing compliance with the rules. So each affected person shall be trained for proper biomedical waste management procedures. Um, each new affected employee shall be trained in biomedical waste management procedures during the initial orientation training. So it's really important to know about this labeling, to know how to handle all of this, um, all of these biomedical wastes, you know, regardless of whether you will be exposed to it or not. Because when you graduate this program, you will encounter many of these types of chemicals. It's just a matter of in what situation, and hopefully it'll be a safe situation for you guys. Um, your, you know, your policy manual talks a little bit about a container labeling, and we will go a lot more into that, into chairside assisting. Um, basically, the labels will contain the following information, the name of the chemical, the hazard warnings to include the target organs, like this can affect your liver or this can affect your kidneys, et cetera. And also the name and the address of the manufacturer, the importer or the responsible party, okay? Uh, there's also a method of labeling and your, your manual talks about that in terms of, you know, adding a zero, a one, two, three, or four, and it categorizes that in terms of risk, whether it's a minimal risk where it's a zero or it's an extreme risk where it's four. And there's also coloring. So, you know, there's, uh, you know, something called color circles that represent certain risks that are involved when using chemical material and correspond to information that's found on what's called the material safety data sheet or the safety data sheets. And that's defined as, you know, when you have red, then it's combustible, blue, it's health, it's a health risk. Uh, yellow circle, they're saying it's reactivity data and it's a black circle, then you need your protective gear. You know, and again, you have to kind of review a lot of these categories to understand uh, the labeling that you will encounter on many of these containers, okay? Um, so your um, program information and policies manual uh, touches base a little bit on um, the management of emergencies and treatment areas. So when something happens, heaven forbid, if something happens in the clinic, it's important to know where everything is located. So when you go down to the clinic, you're on the medical education campus, you're going to learn that room 132 follows you everywhere, that, that, that room follows you everywhere. Um, you'll see that the types of equipment are listed in your policies, um, in your policy manual and the location, which is room 132. You have the resuscitation bag, you have your defibrillator, defibrillator the blood pressure cuffs, emergency kit, first aid kit, oxygen tank, 
the mouth mask resuscitator valve, et cetera. And again, I go back to when we talked about that it's very important that you get your CPR, uh, your BLS certification, because it, it, this is where it comes into play. If something happens, first of all, if you're CPR certified, then you know, what to, you know how to use things. But this manual will tell you where to actually find those things. And they're readily available at the clinic. They're there on the, you know, on, on the floor for you to use. And it's just important that you see where they are. And once you get into the clinic, you will see where things are located. For example, they talk about the two eye wash stations that are available in each clinical bay area. And that's if something gets stuck in your eye, if anything goes in there, you can quickly wash that chemical out with the eye wash stations that are present. Um, again, the sterilization room is located in room 133. So there's another, um, also another eye wash station located there. Um, again, the portable oxygen tank apparatus is also located in room 132, such that if you need to use it, you just roll it over to the patient or the person, and you have them, uh, you have them use that with the, um, with the, with the face valve mask. Okay, um, the management of an emergency uh, situation, uh, hopefully not, but you know, you, participating in clinical activities, you can experience an emergency situation. And when you do, you have to quickly notify your clinical instructor. You have to make sure that the equipment is present and you have to quickly be readily available at hand. Okay, so quickly notify your instructor. If the uh, situation requires additional assistance, obviously you call 9911. Now, normally it's 911, but because you have to dial out on our phones, you have to press nine and then 911, and that'll get you, um, you wanna call the campus police also, and that phone number is listed there as well, 703-764-5000. And you inform the situation to the campus police, okay? And you provide the following information, the type of emergency, the building, the exact location of the victim, uh, the identification and condition of the victim, suspected or known cause of the injury. So it's important to provide that information. And again, I cannot stress this enough. When we go to the clinic, you will know where the phone is. You will know where all these emergency equipment are located. Okay. So you want to provide the appropriate treatment until the assistant arrives. So all accidents or health-related emergency illnesses have to be reported to the business office and the program director within 24 hours. You can't just say, oh, the patient's great, everything's fine. No, you have to go and you have to, you have to document it on paper. Uh, you have to also tell your program director as well because it's, it's really important. And that's considered an incident report, okay? So students, clinical faculty, and staff are required to be familiar with the emergency supplies that are available in the lab area. Um, you know, one of these are the first aid kit. That's something you should know and where, that it, where it's located it and be familiar with it. The fire extinguishers also in the hallway outside the dental materials lab. You have to know where they're all located. Again, you know, your book talks, your man, the manual talks a little bit about where they're all located in terms of the resuscitation bag and the defibrillator and how to manage, um, uh, manage your emergency, okay? We talk a little bit about the use of ionizing radiation policy, and it's been developed in the interest of establishing a consistent standard concerning the use of ionizing radiation. So the primary goal is to assure the safe, effective use of ionizing radiation and to minimize any potential risk from adverse biological effects to the patient, to the student, the faculty, and the staff. So we have a whole list of what, you know, the policy, uh, what it entails. And, you know, it's important to understand the occupational workers that they are defined as dental radiographers. That's the students and faculty. And you're the ones that will be utilizing x-ray radiation for the sole purpose of exposing dental radiographs for diagnosis, for diagno diagnostic purposes. So non-occupational workers are defined as support staff that work in the dental clinic facility, but they don't really engage in the activities that require, you know, x-ray radiation. So it's important to understand those terms. So, you know, please go ahead and review all that. You know, it's really important that you understand what it encompasses in terms of wearing a decimeter, wearing an x-ray badge, and if you're pregnant, you have to wear a fetal badge or a decimeter as well. And they're tested every month because we wanna make sure that students are not being overexposed to any type of scatter radiation or anything of the sort. 
and so is the fetal badge. The fetal badge is also exposed to, is also tested for those things as well. Okay, of course there's criteria for patient selection for exposing radiographs. You can't just get anyone. You're gonna learn in, radio, in radiology when you take that course uh, this fall, you're gonna learn that you will be needing patients and those patients will have a selective criteria. It can't just be anyone. Okay, um, and, and again, we have a whole slew of that and we will just be discussing what are the guidelines or what is it that you need for what, 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 for what type of criteria to fulfill. Okay. So there's something called a full mouth set of x-rays called a full mouth series on a patient. Um, you know, in general, the frequency of exposing, you know, a patient, a full mouth series on a patient is three years or more. We, we don't want you to just bring in any patient who just had a full set of x-rays like six months ago or last year. That's too much radiation. We want someone that, you know, it, it's time for them to take x-rays and now they're coming to you and you can go ahead and take those x-rays on those, on those patients. Okay. So there's a whole a, a list of clinical situations, but they're not limited to these that are, that are listed here in your manual under their radiographic policy. Um, there's also factors that increase risk for caries, but they, 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 they include, but they're not limited to these factors that are listed here on the list down at the, on page 38. The guidelines for administration uh, for something called nitrous oxide and oxygen sedation. That is what everybody is kind of used to hearing on TV, you'll hear, or just in general, you hear people saying, oh, I got laughing gas. Oh, did you get the gas when you got the tooth removed or, or something like that? So many times out in the public, you'll hear people talking about laughing gas. But in the dental field, we call that nitrous oxide or oxygen sedation. And you know, again, there is a way to, to use that. And you're gonna learn all about that in the several courses that you will be exposed to uh, learning this fall semester. And again, it cannot just be anyone that gets that. You know, there's certain criteria that you know that you have to fulfill that a patient can't have that you just come in and they can't do nitrous oxygen sedation for example if you have a stuffy nose you know they have a cold they can't breathe through their nose then this is not for them okay um if you're pregnant um we teach that you know it is not for them to get nitrous sedation so you see there's a, a couple of things that you have to really consider and your manual does does talk about that as well informed consent i mean this will follow you again. This is another staple for your career. Informed consent is basically permission that you are obtaining from the patient and it's written um, and they sign it. It could be on an electronic pamphlet, whichever the case may be, but it is very, it, it is imperative that you obtain written consent from your patients or permission for the, for the following uh, procedure that you will be doing, whether it be oxygen, sedation, nitrous, or radiographs, I mean, you need permission from the patient because what can happen in the future is if you do certain procedures and you didn't ask for permission and something happened to that patient, they say, you know what, I didn't give you permission to do that. And you'll say, well, yeah, you know, you told me that I can go ahead and take uh, radiographs on you, or uh, you told me I could go ahead and use sedation on you. And they said, no, I didn't. So in order to prevent that miscommunication, or any problems down the line, it's really important for clarity and communication in a sense where the patient go, goes ahead and gives you a verbal consent as well as a written consent. And that written consent is, is the staple for a, like all your procedures that you will do, okay? Your manual talks about pre-administration of performing nitrous oxide or oxygen sedation, okay? And they also talk about the patient themselves, okay? And, and, and like how it helps, like in what situation it helps. And it also talks about the actual administration. And it's just a synopsis. I mean, we can go into detail when you touch this space. I believe in chair-side assisting, we will talk further about nitrous, um, uh, nitrous and how to administer it in detail. But this is a great summary um, in your policies manual to, talk, to, to learn about just an overall uh, schematic to to understand. And then of course there's post administration. You don't just take off the mask, stop the administration, like turn off the, the gas and that's it. There's a way to do it. There's a way to step down from it. And you, you should go ahead and review that because if you just stop the stop the gas and take off the mask, that's very dangerous. That's not good for uh, that's not good for the patient at all. Document uh, documentation, I cannot say this enough. Document, document, document. Um, informed consent was one of them. 
you know, you want to write down in the patient's chart or even type, you know, if you have, you know, obviously nowadays everything is computerized. When you go out into practice or even down here at the campus, it's important to document and say what you did for the patient. When you bring in your patients for radiology, for example, it's important to document in the patient notes on the screen saying what you did, if you encountered any problems, and um, you know, how, how did the patient present to begin with when they came to you. Those are very important and also what to do next on the patient, okay? Um, you, 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 documentation is basically like a diary. It tells uh, the person who is to review the patient's chart or to review the patient's log that what was done. And it allows for clarity, allows for better communication. Okay. All of our equipment is monitored and maintained. There's weekly, uh, before, um, weekly and before clinical sessions, of course. Um, there's also monthly sessions to ensure everything is working properly. With the weekly sessions, we make sure that the cylinders contain enough gas, the nitrous cylinders contain enough gas, that all the connections are tight, all the tubing is accurate, everything is working up to par, there's no holes in anything. Uh, with the monthly um, sessions, the monthly um, inspections, I could say, is you want to ensure that everything is checked, like the emergency air valve, the non-breathing valve, the power oxygen flush valve. Those are very important because if these things are not checked and you're doing the procedure, we could have a problem. Uh, we also have exposure limits. Um, the goal is to limit the time-weighted average exposures of 25 parts per million or ppm or less for students and faculty that are within four feet radius of the patient's mouth. And again, you're going to learn about these recommendations and the agencies that, rec that, that regulate these things. Um, like, for example, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, the NIOSH, um, you're going to learn about all those agencies in um, oral professions, and you'll learn what they entail. And, and, you know, they set the standards. They're the ones that tell us, you know, this is what you should be doing, and they tell us the research, just like CDC guidelines tell us what to do. Um, the nitrous oxide levels will be monitored approximately every four to six weeks during the spring semester when the nitrous oxide oxygen machine is being utilized during those sessions, okay? So keep all those in mind. Um, you know, again, it's, it's just really important to know pregnant faculty, staff, or pregnant students, you have to be aware of the risks associated with nitrous oxide exposure while you're working in the setting, okay? Anyone who's pregnant has to notify, you know, you gotta notify the program director, um, and you have to have a written statement from your physician. Uh, and, it, and all of this is kept on file, and the nitrous oxide exposure monitoring badge will be issued and worn on your clinical jacket uh, near the breathing zone, okay? And, and at the conclusion of the clinical session, the badge is to be sent for analysis of the exposure to nitrous oxide. 